And what kind of life did they lead? Because, you know, you've talked about the hostility they encountered sometimes and the fact that they were sort of physically peripheral to, to these universities. So what kind of experience did they have going away from home for the first time? It was a very mixed experience going away from home for the first time because obviously they were leaving their families and they were leaving their friends. In many cases, they were going against the wishes of um, members of their family in order to go to university. But once they got there, they were so enclosed um, mm. that they might almost not have left mm. home at all. Mm. And, and these early women's colleges were very much designed to be like sort of extended country house parties. Really, mm. They were only allowed out at certain times and to certain places. If they did go outside the college precincts, then they had to have a chaperone with them. The rules and regulations were absolutely baffling. Everything was regulated, and they had intellectual freedom, certainly, for the first time, and and that's a great thing. But physically, no, not at all. But they did form close friendships, and you you write about cocoa parties and things like that. So there was obviously a a sort of collegiate feeling of sorority in in those institutions. Yes, there was, but, but I think institutions is, is the right word to use. It, it was very much um, an enclosed community in a women's college. Mm. And, and that was great. That, that had lots of benefits for women, as you say, having the, um, the close friendships and the cocoa parties mm. and learning about um, other people's upbringings and ideas. But, but they could only look in at college. They couldn't look out. That, that came later. And what kind of expectations did they go to university with those, those early generations? What did they think the point of a degree was, even if their parents weren't quite clear about it? I think most of them thought that the point of a degree was some sort of escape from domesticity. Not necessarily the sort of domesticity that meant you had to do housework all day, but perhaps the sort that meant you just had to sit about all day Mm -hmm. and and read books of which somebody else approved, but you weren't allowed to choose. It was all a matter of changing the routine which had limited women's lives for so long and having some sort of um, autonomy, I think, in, in choosing what to do afterwards. Although it's rather ironic, of course, that the outside world didn't catch up with women um, in terms of university because long after they were allowed to take degrees, the expectation when they left was extremely low. They, they were either to get married or they were to, to slip back into their domestic duty. Do you think they did find it difficult to go out into a world that wasn't really ready for them? I mean, you talk about you know marriage or teaching really being the two avenues open to them when they left and, and more of them tended to go into teaching than to get married. So do you think the world just wasn't, it wasn't, it was difficult for them to find a place in a, in a world that was changing slowly? It was difficult to find a place and ironically, as in many other cases, it was the, um, the First and the Second World Wars which really began to open the door for after they left university mm. because they were able to, to fill the gaps that had been left by men, not just in, in manual work, but in the professions as well. And precedent, I think, is, is a great thing in, in any great enterprise like, um, like women's education. And once the precedent had been set, it was difficult to put the, um, the genie back in the bottle. And I get the strong impression that you have great admiration for those, those women who often had quite a, a difficult time of it um, between, between family and these institutions. Yes, I think those who had the hardest time were those who realized the value of their education the most and those who wanted to pass on what they had learned in, in terms of freedom and, and self-discovery with the most passion. And so you'll get people whose families nearly broke themselves to mm. send these girls to university in the hope that once they had got their education, they would help the whole family. Those are the people who would perhaps become teachers, yes, but it, but it was no bad thing because they were inspiring the next generation so strongly. And I think it was the pioneers like this who'd had a really hard time, who's set the most solid foundation for those of us who who are lucky enough to have gone to university today. And finally, Jane, your book is full of wonderful, quirky details and anecdotes. And I think my absolute favorite was of the admissions interview at St. Hilda's College. And I wondered if you could just, if you, you probably know the one I'm thinking about. Yes, I think so. By, by um, the fireside. Tell, tell, me, tell me about that, because I love that story. There were some extremely eccentric tutors at some of the um, early women's colleges, and some might say that there still are. <laughs> but um, there's a lovely story of one girl who wanted to read English at St. Hilda's College, um, Oxford. She worked so hard, especially on her Shakespeare, and she was terribly nervous about interviews. 
And it was a December evening and she was led in to see um, the woman who would become her tutor if she got in. And she was running through the Shakespeare in her head as she walked in and she sat down and it was firelight, a very dim light. And the tutor was sitting by the fire and she was making shadow animals with her fingers. And she was casting elephants and rabbits onto the wall. And the poor girl sat down thinking, well, how on earth are we going to get to Shakespeare from this? And the tutor looked up and smiled benignly and said, do you think you could make a rabbit on the wall? 